thank you everyone for joining the Thesis Capital webinar series today. Uh, this will be an update live with the Fanginet Entertainment team. Uh, for those that don't know, Fanginet trades on the CSC under the ticker FANS, F-A-N-S, and on the OTCQV under the ticker FUN, F-U-N-F-F. Uh, the format of today will be a Q&A session. The duration of the presentation will be 45 minutes in nature. Uh, viewers are encouraged to uh, ask as many questions as possible. There is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen where you can submit questions. We will try our hardest to get to every single one of them. Um, if we do not get to your questions, feel free to send them to info at thesiscapital.ca and we can respond to them uh, after this call. We are live streaming on YouTube. If you are um, interested in um, sending the link to any other attendees or any other prospective investors. Uh, with that out of the way, I'm going to turn the call over to um, Scott and Darius. Scott Burton is the CEO of Fanzina Entertainment. Darius Igdami, the president of Fanzina Entertainment. Scott, Darius, uh, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Um, let's begin. There's obviously been a lot, a lot of activity in uh, the gambling sector over the last few weeks, specifically on the M&A front. Um, if you guys as could, I mean, we've seen Betworks, a sports betting technology company, being acquired by Bailey's Corporation. Recently, we saw again a public traded company in the U.S. Um, acquire CoolBets. Um, with that activity, what do you guys think that means for the sector as a whole? And specifically, what does it mean for companies like Fanginite? Yeah, I can start. Um, you know, it's been great. I think this really all started um, earlier on this year when DraftKings acquired SD Tech for about 700 million U.S. Um, they wanted to bring technology in-house, which I think is the key in all these acquisitions right now. Everyone's realizing that, you know, technology is key and they want to bring that in-house. And that's something Scott and I have been preaching for years, right? That's why we've been spending years and millions of dollars building out our own technology. Because once you own your own technology, you have the ability to differentiate, right? You can be a little bit more nimble, um, add new features and, and do all those types of things. So I think we're seeing a lot of companies um, bring in technology as is probably one of their biggest cost centers. And that's why Scott and I have just been really focused and heads down on our own technology over the course of the last few years. On that note, though, so given that there is a surge in M&A activity, generally that means that obviously things are picking up in this space. Why do you think now more than anything? Do you think this is related to COVID? Do you think this is just related to the fact that more people are sitting at home? Or where, what do you attribute to the surge really in online gambling? Yeah, pro probably a little bit of both, right? So, I mean, of course, during the pandemic, um, a lot of the sports shut down, uh, a lot of the bricks and mortars casinos shut down. So you saw really a big surge into the online space. And that's exactly what we saw, right? Even though sports shut down for a few months, we saw a big increase on the casino side. And um, and we don't think that's really going away. We think there's an actual, you know, cultural shift and, and people's uh, consumers' habits are going to go towards online gaming. So that's why I think we're seeing a big surge on, on online. That's why I think we're seeing a big surge on a lot of these gaming companies, um, you know, above and beyond that, we're seeing more and more kind of jurisdictions open up, um, especially in North America, which now over the course of the last couple of years, it's state by state, um, but more and more states are coming online. We just got more word from Canada as well that they're potentially opening up. Um, so I think we're seeing more jurisdictions open up and I think we're seeing kind of a full shift in consumer habits to online gaming. I think um, if I could just add, Darius mentioned a couple of things in the last two answers that also, I think help address the question, which is um, the it being a high cost center for for the operators, and then also the shift to um, to more regulation. So the opening of the U.S. in the last couple of years, so the repeal of PASPA. So now you're up to I think 26 states that are going to allow sports betting. Uh, that's going to continue to grow. iGaming is going to come along. Um, so people are looking to, one, take advantage of that because people, I think, see it as the biggest betting opportunity that's come along in decades, accessing the U.S. market. Um, but then when you look at the cost of regulation, and more and more countries are moving to regulation, which is why we've always positioned ourselves to operate in highly regulated regions, but it is expensive. So when you're a large company and you see your costs going up, both on a technology cost side, but then also on the regulatory side, um, you know, something's got to give and, and it's not the governments that give usually. So, so I think they're seeing that, you know, by bringing tech in house, they can remove that massive cost base and still operate and move forward in a, in a highly regulated space. Cause that's the way we expect it to go. 
Okay, perfect. Um, you mentioned on Ontario, there was some news a, a couple of weeks ago, if you guys want to touch on that uh, in terms of regulatory advancement um, for our viewers that actually don't understand, I mean, it'd be great for everyone to get an update because it's close to home here. Yeah, so it's it's really good news and exciting news. Um, obviously, uh, as I mentioned earlier, governments are, are involved. So um, the, the speed at which it happens is hard to predict. But, um, you know, I think all indications are people are fairly positive that we'll see some movement in 2021 uh, with the Canadian market. And Ontario is looking to be the first mover. So it was in their most recent budget, but they're looking to move uh, control of the, the regulated gaming space over to the AGCO, the Alcohol Gaming Commission of Ontario. Uh, that will take it away from the OLG. And the AGCO has been pretty clear that they want to create a, um, I guess, a more open marketplace to give consumer choice in terms of online betting and, and gaming opportunities. So, so their model is to um, be more of a, a regulator as opposed to an operator. So it'll follow along the lines of the more established markets, like when we look at the UK, uh, we look at Europe. Um, you know, this may all seem fairly new to North America and all the news in the US, but it's been going on for decades in, in other places. So, so there are very good models to follow. And, you know, we expect that um, they'll do that. So what they'll do is open up Ontario to outside operators. Um, so you don't have to be a government entity. Uh, you will have to be licensed. You will have to follow some strict rules. Um, that fits into our model nicely because we've done that. Um, we've been through some top tier jurisdictions. Uh, we expect that there could be preference given to operators like ourselves. Um, not just the fact that we're in Canada, which I think will make us an attractive partner on the technology front. Um, you're going to have brick and mortars in Canada looking to how, how to get in. Um, but also the fact that we've been through some of those jurisdictions that Ontario is looking to for guidance. So, so we think it gives us a good advantage having been through technical audits, licensing, having a uh, management and key person infrastructure that allows us to operate around the world. Um, we don't see Ontario putting in any regulations that wouldn't match what we've already done. Um, also think that it won't be the only province to do that. So. So what we think will happen is Ontario will, will sort of take the first step and make the first move. Um, I don't doubt that other provinces aren't looking at it already and closely and we'll watch Ontario and see how it rolls out. So, so we think that we're just at the very, very beginning of a Canada opening up uh, much more to uh, outside operators. We're positioned well for that um, and, uh, and we're excited. So we'll follow along. But uh, we expect that would be one big change. The other one is the repeal of uh, Bill C-218, um, which will open up single match betting, which is which is seen as a major hurdle right now for sports betting operations. So uh, currently in Canada, under the federal uh, rules, you can't bet on a single sporting event. Puts operators at a huge disadvantage to offshore operators. So I think it's estimated four to five billion dollars of Canadian betting activity is going offshore right now. So that's money that is not being regulated. It's not being watched. So you know Canada could be a ten billion dollar industry that's about to open up uh, to operators, you know, like ourselves. Hmm. Interesting. Um, and the industry as a whole right now. I mean, for our viewers, obviously that are new to the story. You have sports betting, uh, which I think many people here are familiar with. It's a massive industry. It's only getting bigger, as you just mentioned. But talk talk us through some of the other um, areas of gambling that are emerging and emerging as kind of leaders, specifically maybe esports. Even um, there's obviously a big segment of esports uh, with within fans and I both in the B two B side and both in the B two C side. But where do you really see that sector going as a whole uh, in the online gambling market? Yeah, so it's, um, I mean, it's gone from basically zero a few years ago to, uh, to a significant piece to, to some operators. Not all operators have, um, I would say, effectively jumped on with esports or, or treating it uh, with the respect I think it deserves as a category within a sports book. Um, but you look to one of the biggest operators in the world, uh, like Pinnacle, um, took their first esports bet in 2010, have been a real leader. And I think they've said it's the, you know, the fourth biggest market they have right now. So when you look at one of the biggest sports books in the world saying it's their fourth biggest market, uh, I think you have to take notice and, and see what's going on. So, so we positioned ourselves to try and be at the beginning of this tidal wave of esports activity, esports betting. 
Um, there's some numbers that came out of the pandemic, which were, you know, I think pretty interesting. And that's looking at um, UK betting operators. So some of the more public operators in the UK, um, you know, during the pandemic when sports shut down initially, markets they offered on esports I think went up 3,000% year over year. So the amount of markets they made available, um, some of them were saying that it's three to 5% of their uh, net gaming revenue on betting activity, which is still a big number. You know, the most recent one I heard from what I would say is, um, you know, a, a very knowledgeable research group in the gaming space is they think in the next number of years, maybe a decade or, or less, uh, esports betting could make up 10% of a sports booked activity. Um, you know, you're talking sports betting is in the hundreds of billions of dollars. Um, you now have a category that really just is coming out uh, that could be 10% of that within under, you know, under 10 years. So it's huge opportunity. Um, you know, we were before the merge. Ascot was really an esports focused company, uh, but also looking to move into sports. Um, so I don't think you can be right now a full, you know, gambling suite with, without having all the pieces that you need. Um, so esports is is a big piece of it. Um, we needed to look to traditional sports. We were already looking at the casino style games that we do. Um, so that's why the, the merge with Fans Unite was was perfect timing for us because we were looking uh, and Fans United also identified that they needed to, to look at esports. So, so that's kind of how we came together and, and um, excited about all parts of the business, but esports is is got huge outside potential. Perfect. So with that, out of the, with that said, so Scott, I mean, there's a lot of existing investors on this call. I'm sure there's prospective investors, just anyone that's interested. Can you walk us through the three really elements of Fans Unite? You know, you have the B2C part, the B2B part, and then obviously Ascot Games. If you could give everyone a kind of a quick overview of what each part does, and then we'd like to dive into each part separately. Yeah, so I'll start at the sort of the backbone of now the entire company, which is the technology that we we own and have built and are, and are building still, um, which is, you know, the, the gaming platform that we call Chameleon. Um, so this is the, you know, top to bottom full service turnkey product that can power any brand. Um, and it can be sports betting, it can be esports betting, it can be iGaming or iGaming slash casino. Uh, it can be all three or it can be any component of that. Um, we can cover everything needed in terms of licensing. So we have the ability to sub-license gaming license to operators. So if someone just wants to run a brand and focus on customer acquisition, uh, we can power that for them without them having to go through the full licensing, uh, setting up servers around the world, um, filling out key roles, all of that we can do. So that includes banking, which is a, a challenging part of online gambling and payments, which is probably the most challenging part. So multiple payment options built into the platform, um, plugged into a number of different products in terms of affiliate management systems, uh, 15 plus payment uh, options right now, the ability to handle crypto, uh, reporting functions. So all that's the, the backbone and the technology. So from there, uh, we focus on um, B2B revenue, which is uh, high margin and highly scalable with massive upside. So with a B2B contract, um, you know, it, it starts with us getting an upfront integration fee with a partner, then we do a monthly minimum license fee. So we have a, a guaranteed monthly recurring revenue model there, uh, and then huge upside potential. So we do a revenue share above that monthly minimum. So as our partners grow and scale up, um, we take a percentage of the revenue. And so we're all really motivated by the same thing with us and our partners is to, to grow and scale. Um, then the next part is, is the B2C brands that we, we operate. McBookie is, is the flagship, I guess, of the Fans Unite uh, ecosystem at the moment. Um, so that is a UK focused sports book, really focused on Scotland. Um, it's been sports uh, traditionally over 10 years in operations, uh, run by two great guys, Paul and Damien, who understand that market inside out. So it's a really niche market product, but profitable, uh, low cost, currently uses someone else's uh, technology platform and licensing, but we think we can help complement that with uh, acquiring our own UK license and then adding some technology pieces that scale that business up really quickly. Um, announced their biggest month ever in October. So after 10 years of operations, um, biggest month ever in October, 
Uh, we expect that to, you know, we've we put out some public numbers before, but that that's a business that can, um, you know, more than double uh, from where it's at today uh, with the infrastructure we're adding around that. So that's the the first B two C brand. Then we um, we launched. A, there's a brand um, coming recently that was called Vamos. Um, and that's an esports first brand focused on the Latin American market, primarily Brazil. And it's an example of what owning our technology allows us to do and having our own gaming licenses is that we can look at a specific market, like Bookie did in Scotland, um, and with our sort of cost structure and our infrastructure, uh, we can launch really regional specific brands, which allows us to hyper localize the brand to that market. Uh, but really focus in on the things that affect customer acquisition, which is payment options, um, banking, uh, marketing with local talent. Uh, so we can lower the customer acquisition costs. We can increase the um, uh, turnover or the ability for people to get into the sites by having the right payment methods for the local market, having the right language. So we want to look to do that potentially on the B2C side of the company is find opportunities to leverage our technology, leverage our licenses, and then look to local partners who can help on the marketing front on the ground like we have with Paul and Damien in, in the UK market with Scotland. So that's the B2C model moving forward. Um, and, uh, and then the third part is Ascot Games. So Ascot Games is a division of the company now that is focused on building out um, what we call sort of, they're, they're RNG games, they're random number generated games. And we have our own certified random number generator, which powers these games. So, so it allows us to build endless amounts of games on top of that. And if you don't know what that is, it's if you go to any online casino game, if you go to poker, if you go to blackjack, if you go to roulette, really at the foundation of that is the random number generator. So it's, a, it's an auditable and, and provably fair system of, of running these games. Uh, so we have all these concepts and themes that we're doing, but again, focused on coming from our esports roots um, and understanding the the demographic. We're we're building games that appeal to you know the 20 to 30 year olds, 20 to 32 year olds, uh, who the the online casinos and sports books are struggling to acquire right now. And if they do acquire them through betting, uh, every sports book has a casino. Every sports book wants their betters to go to the casino. Uh, but if there's nothing there that appeals to them, they're not going to go. So you've lost that chance to monetize and, and keep a user. Uh, the beauty of these games is they run 24-7. So if you, you do have a complete sports shutdown, uh, they're still there and people still use them sometimes more in these situations. So, so we're building games with video game themes, uh, esports themes, look and feel. Very different from what the typical casino slot machine is right now. Uh, excited about that because we're getting amazing feedback. Uh, we find that everybody we talk to uh, wants the games like that, that fill that void. So we are in the process now of just finishing up our third game. We've already started the fourth game. We look to have about 10 games out next year. And we're going to be distributing them not only through our own platform, so we can uh, offer them up to any partner using Chameleon as another way to increase revenue, but also we can um, go to distribution partners called aggregators. So there's casino game aggregators and there's many of them out there. And uh, by one integration, so by integrating with them, our games can access hundreds or thousands of sites and millions of people. So we, we announced one a few weeks ago with our first partner, a European aggregator called the Ear platform. The Ear is plugged in with 120 plus sports books and online casinos. Uh, so right there, once we're in there, uh, that's potential for 120 sports books and casinos to turn on our games. Uh, that could be up to 10 games, and that's just through one aggregator. Um, very positive feedback. And Scott, that, and Scott, sorry to cut you off. That's just in Europe, correct? Yeah, so that's, that's just uh, in Europe. So that's just focused on the European market. Um, so, yeah, we uh, we are going after U.S., North America. We'll be going after Asia. So it's a great distribution model for us. Um, like I said, uh, the conversation starter is easy. You know, we have games that appeal to 20 to 30-year-olds. Do you want to talk? Yes. Um, and, and so we're, we're having great success in terms of early talks and and that's going to be a big piece. We want to get, um, you know, through our fourth game. That's when we think we have a pretty good stable to, to really push the large aggregators. 
um, which which should be done in the next uh, you know short amount of time because we're already working on that. Um, we're getting more efficient at putting these games out, so we're going to ramp up the uh, the production of them next year. So I think that covers the the three parts. Sorry, it was a bit long. No, it was, it was great. It's very in depth. Um, you know, one of the questions that we always get, and some of our viewers um, obviously um, uh, ask us, is there's three segments of the business. They're all very different in terms of their revenue models. Um, some of them obviously can uh, lead to substantial revenue, high margin revenue. Where is Fantinet really focusing their capital uh, right now? And which segment do you see the, the biggest driver of shareholder returns? Yeah, I can, I can, I can answer that. So you know, we think our, our um, lowest hanging fruit right now is growth on our own B2C platforms. That's McBookie um, and Vamos. So we are definitely focusing on, on growing those. Right now we're growing those mostly organically, which is uh, giving us a lot of confidence for, for the future on those platforms. But as Scott mentioned, our biggest blue sky is definitely on the B2B, right? Um, that's where our revenue really starts to compound. The more clients we get, the more aggregators and casinos that our games go into. So, you know, long-term vision for us really B2B focused is game focused, getting as many clients as we can licensing our technology and building, you know, that full suite of, of 10 games, hopefully for next year, as Scott mentioned, getting those into hundreds and, and potentially thousands of different sports books. Okay, perfect. Um the other area, obviously, of gaming that's quite interesting is obviously, you know, licensing. Various jurisdictions are going through regulatory overhauls right now. There's a lot of licenses out there and, you know, leads to some confusion amongst um, investors. Can you walk us through, I mean, some of the more prominent licenses out there, um, where you want to be as not only a company, but if you're in this space, which licenses are the most sought after, uh, which markets do they represent? And then more importantly, which licenses is Fans Unite um, is going after and what will that mean for the company? Yeah, so, um, so going back to 2013, we've been licensing uh, in a number of jurisdictions in that time. So uh, there's been changes and, and shifts, but, um, you know, the, the overall trajectory hasn't changed. We're, there, there's going to be more, more and more regulation and more licensing. Um, so, so when we looked at it originally, you know, we, we looked at the UK, the UK and, and what operates under the UKGC, um, the UK Gaming Commission, Gambling Commission, sorry. And, and they really set the, what's considered the standard of, of online gaming regulations. They've been at it a very long time. Um, so, so they set out a white list of jurisdictions initially, which meant that if you, if you went through one of those jurisdictions, um, you know, Isla Man being one, for example, where we got our first licenses, uh, you could still, you know, operate offshore and then take uh, UK customers. And it's really about who you can market to publicly. So you have marketing channels. If you're licensed in the UK, you can market directly to the UK users. Um, in 2015, I believe it was, they, they changed that and they got rid of the whitelist. They wanted you to, um, you know, come back and get a UK license, pay point of consumption tax on UK users. Um, so, so it became a little less desirable if you wanted to access the UK to, to sit in an Isle of Man or places like that. Um, we saw that coming. Uh, we, we decided uh, we wanted to uh, have the, the best European license with the most coverage. So we moved to the E, um, sorry, Malta. So we said before, we're, we're through the Malta process mostly. We're, we're just waiting on final approvals uh, for two licenses there. So our, our idea around Malta was it's still considered a top tier jurisdiction, you know, meets the strictest standards as the UK, um, allows you to operate in many places throughout Europe, and, and it gives two types of licenses. So we, we want the flexibility to operate as a software provider, uh, but then also as either a brand or, or operate white labels. So we're getting a, a two licenses in Malta. Uh, so it will be a critical software supply license. And that's a requirement of other EU or Malta licensed operators to, to get their software from a, a licensed provider. So, so what that does is to date, um, we haven't taken Chameleon to any uh, European operators or we haven't done any deals with it yet, uh, just waiting on um, Malta licensing. So once that's complete, we're through technical audits, we're through all of the uh, corporate due diligence. So. So once that's complete, we access now uh, a European market in terms of our B2B products. Uh, the B2C license, the direct-to-consumer license we have, will not you know, allow us to operate our own brands, but it'll also allow us to do white labeling, which is where uh, I mentioned earlier, if somebody wants to run a betting site, 
or a casino site that doesn't want the uh, hassle and the headache of uh, going through licensing and maintaining that, uh, we can offer them a site powered by us uh, with their brand and we still handle all the regulatory stuff but it can operate as a direct to consumer site. So we've got very good uh, European coverage with that license. And then with McBookie, uh, as I said, they're a UK operator, so they're operating in um, in one of the you know hardest regimes to get a license. So we're starting that process, or we've begun that process to acquire a UK license, um, also on the software side, but on behalf of McBookie, so they can uh, operate under their own license. So that will now give us uh, UK, which is the gold standard of licensing around the world. Uh, and it will give us Malta, which is the oldest licensing jurisdiction in Europe and considered probably one of the best places to be licensed. So major coverage there. And then through partnership of software agreement we have, we have um, the ability to do licensing through a Curacao license. Uh, that gives us kind of ultimate flexibility globally. So if somebody needs uh, flexibility in licensing, potentially lower cost and to access some markets um, that we don't do through Malta or UK. We can do that out of uh, Curacao. As I mentioned, a massive group like Pinnacle has been licensed in Curacao for years. I expect there's going to be some changes coming from the, uh, the Dutch government around licensing there, which will um, bring them along to probably a, a bit of a higher tier of license. So we're prepared for that when that happens. And then uh, we announced in the U.S. The U.S. is, again, a whole the whole you know, store, new story about licensing and, and how fragmented it can be. So the U.S. takes the approach, as they do with most things, as that it's a state decision, and they push that uh, decision down to the state level to manage the, the, the licensing and regulation. So that happened a couple of years ago around sports betting. Uh, quite quickly, it got up to about 23 states, I believe, um, uh, made the approval to allow sports betting. We're up to 26, I believe, after the most recent elections. Um, no doubt that's going to move towards 50 in the next few years. Um, obviously, there's massive tax revenue and things that it'll generate. So the U.S., if you want to go in there, you're going to have to go state by state. Not every state has made it clear what that is. I've heard numbers as high as $20 million to be licensed in certain states. Uh, there's some you know, brick and mortar requirements that some states are talking about, so you need a land-based presence. So for us, we've uh, planned to sit on the sidelines a bit in terms of the U.S. and wait and see, but um, we knew probably it doesn't make sense for us to go in in our B2C uh, aspect, so trying to create a brand and go into the U.S. Uh, that's going to be, it, with that model, it plays really well to the huge operators. Uh, we've seen FanDuel and DraftKings, I think, suck up up to 65 70% of the market in places like New Jersey, um, then you've got MGMs rolling in, then you've got um, Penn and the deal they did with Barstool. So it's it's huge dollars. And we saw this model play out with Daily Fantasy down there where it's just spend like crazy on land grab customer acquisition. That doesn't suit us well. What does suit us well is the need for technology. And so we can go in as a technology partner uh, to the people looking to get into the space. Um, so that's the opportunity we're looking at now. And with all these acquisitions you mentioned, so we've seen SB Tech, we've seen GameWorks, we're going to see more, um, more and more of the guys that people would have called for tech are gone. Um, so it, again, it opens the door for us. It's great timing for us because um, if you wanted to use SB Tech, you're probably not going to now because DraftKings owns them. Um, yeah. so, so it's a great timing aspect for us and we have moved in quicker than we expected because of a, a deal we also announced with Gameco. So Gameco is licensed throughout the U.S. as uh, more of a uh, partner to brick and mortar casinos. So they were providing cabinet games which are along the themes that we mentioned for our online RNG games. So Gameco has the same approach of trying to appeal to same demographic with the uh, cabinet machines in a casino, so driving younger users to play those games in casino. Um, so they have a, the same sort of vision on content and where we think the market's going. And they have great relationships throughout the US. They give us license coverage. So they've become a reseller of our platform there. Uh, so we're, we're again, very excited about that. They're a great company to work with. They have good reputation. They have great relationships and good licensing. So, so that. Excuse me, takes away the um, 
the licensing uh, hurdle for us. And, and that was going to be a big one to tackle, which is why we um, had focused on Europe, focused on UK, focused on the Curacao. Uh, but this game co just, uh, I think we've said it before, accelerate us probably 12 months at least in terms of our move into the US. So look forward to working with game co and, and hopefully announcing um, a first installation of the platform with them you know, in the near future. Perfect. Uh, so one more question before Canada. we turn it over to um, some, some of the viewers here. So as a reminder to viewers, if you have any questions, you can submit them through the Q&A function and we'll get to them shortly. Um, so you mentioned all these acquisitions that are happening, Scott, and most of them are technology enabled companies. So for Fans United itself, I mean, obviously Fans United and Ascot just went through this, you know, fairly substantial merger. What is the M&A strategy? What is it that if you guys were to go out and buy something today, you know, what would it be? What jurisdiction? How are you guys looking at M&A? Sorry, I just muted. Darius, you want to grab it? Sure. Yeah, sounds good. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, we've done obviously two transactions, you know, this year acquiring McBookie, which we thought, you know, was a was a nice gem that we found in the UK. And of course, the transformational uh, merger with Ascot. So I guess, you know, um, the things we look at kind of that we, we've talked about, I guess, over the last few months, uh, we're looking at technology always looking to add technology. Um, we have, we're trying to build a full iGaming platform with zero exit points for our clients, right? So that means making sure we service them from traditional sports betting, uh, eSports, from casino, and you know other things you know, such as virtual sports and live dealers, stuff like that. So we're always looking at a new technology to be able to bring into our platform. Um, always looking at, uh, at deals to, to bring in revenue and to bring user base. So looking for kind of new niche um, sports books or casino offerings, like McBookie, McBookie kind of 2.0 in, in Europe. Um, we're looking at, at deals like that always. And I think with the, with the team that we brought on and, and with the board members um, between Harish and, and Chris Grove and James Keane and Scott and myself, we have a tremendous access to deal flow, which has been really nice. Um, we're seeing a lot of deals, um, you know, passing up on a lot, but we're, we know kind of what we're looking for. So, you know, technology, user base and revenue, those are really the three, the three key things we want to bring into the company moving forward. Okay, great. So there's a lot of questions here. Uh, well, that's a great question here. What are three of the biggest hurdles a company will face, in your view, in the upcoming year, and how do you plan on overcoming them? Um, in so three hurdles in the upcoming year, and um, I guess in for gambling, do you think, or in just in general? I think in general, I think, I think as a statement to the entire industry, there's a lot going on, obviously. It is a cash intensive industry. What is it one hurdle yeah. that you think as a company you're going to need to get overcome? Yeah, I mean, I, specific to us um, right now, you know, a hurdle, you know, one of the challenges, but it's, it's because of the opportunities, we have so much opportunity coming at us. Um, we, we need to, you know, move quicker on scaling. So adding people right now is, is a big priority for us. Um, we've got the technology infrastructure to scale. We just need to, to add people in the right places. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty, I guess, around the, the financial world. Now that we're in the public markets, we, we have to pay attention to that. And, um, and, and we've gone through a pretty turbulent time, I guess, with politically and everything going on in the U.S. and the pandemic. So I think, um, you know, cash cash position going into another uncertain year around that. I mean, things are, look positive, but... Uh, but making sure we're in a cash position again, like we did going into the uh, the merge to, to ride out if there's any issues around um, more global shutdowns or anything like that. So so I think we, we think about that. We're in a very good position right now. We positioned ourselves well with the financing. We're positioning ourselves well with the ramp and revenue. So, so a couple of things there I just, you know, we think about is, you know, are we prepared for any uncertainty around, you know, if markets shut down again? Um, we've been preparing for that on the business side. What we saw with McBookie, the growth is partly because of the pandemic. We pivoted to focusing on non-sports related stuff. So um, if you're in the sports betting world, uncertainty around sports markets is going to be a big one. And that's why um, eSports for us is big and having the uh, the casino ramp we're doing with our games. So in gambling, I think that's, that's a, a challenge to look at. Um, if you are a sports book, uh, how are you going to react again if, if sports shuts down? Um, so th those are the ones that I think we think about mostly right now. Yeah, and I think I'd just for a viewer, I think, um, you know, the team of fans have done a great, great job um, pivoting and 
it kind of speaks to not only the management team and the board, but also the fact that it's a full iGaming suite, right? You have zero exit points, as Darius mentioned. Um, so it makes, you know, things, uh, you know, less challenging in uncertain environments. So um, next question, uh, can Ask Our Games be used to integrate with online betting providers as well? Yeah. Yeah. So we built that as, um, as a standalone company um, or a standalone, you know, part of the company, uh, obviously wholly owned by fans, but it is done so it can integrate directly with uh, anybody. And so there's, there's one key part to that, which um, people asking may know or may not know is what they call an RGS, which, which is a remote gaming server. And so any game that uh, is going to have is going to be used within somebody's platform or site needs to be powered by a, an RGS that's in some cases certified. So our reasoning for right now going through aggregators is they have the RGS in place, which is, allows us to plug into their remote gaming server and then from there distribute it out to partners if it's a sports book. So if it's a sports book that uh, currently has an aggregator in place or, or more than one, and they're interested in our games, um, they can contact us at Ascot Games site. So ascot.games or ascotgames.com um, and talk to us and we can work directly with their aggregator to push our games into that platform. So, so we are seeing some pull like that where the operators we talk to, we show them the games and they will pull them through their aggregator onto their site. So. So we can do that way. Um, if it's a direct integration they're looking for with us and they, they don't currently work with an aggregator, uh, we are going to be um, certifying our own RGS uh, next year, which would then allow us to do direct integrations to people without an aggregator in the middle. Okay, great. Uh, so just question around listing. Um, you guys uh, just recently uplisted to the OTCQB. Uh, congrats on that. Um, any plans around a potential NASDAQ listing? Obviously, we've seen some uh, gaming or uh, game companies on the periphery of gaming anyways um, entertain that. We saw Enthusiast Gaming's about to list on NASDAQ. Um, I think Versus uh, Systems has also um, uh, dropped some news the other day that they wanted to list on the NASDAQ. Um, any plans around that um, and entering, uh, entering that market? I see. Um, it's one that's that's appealing for us. Um, it was one we we haven't put on the the near term horizon. We've got a lot of execution to do. Um, you know, I think we we it's been fast. We completed this merge on August 11th. You know, and, and, and in that time, you know, we've done deals with Pinnacle. We've done deals with Gameco. We're adding licenses. Uh, we moved to the QB. Um, and we've done the aggregator deal. So so we've got a lot of execution to do still. Um, a lot of things we want to do. So uh, I think for us, we want to take the next few months and focus on that. Um, but it's, it's something that we, you know, we've talked about in the future. Um, obviously, access to bigger capital is, is where we're going to want to be. Um, we're, we're pretty happy with the performance we've had to date. So we just want to be able to show that that growth continues. Um, and, and I don't think we've really hit um, our stride in terms of the revenue ramp and the execution and everything. So, so I think in the few months that we have, that's the real focus of the business. Um, we, we've had to take our eyes off of the business to do things like complete the merge, complete a financing, um, move to the OTCQB, get gaming licenses in place. So, so you know, we've done that. Um, I think giving us a regulatory breather uh, for a little bit is going to be good for the business. And then, um, you know, we'll come back to that, uh, you know, next year. Okay, perfect. Uh... So anyone, if, if there's any other questions uh, uh, of yours, you guys can um, submit them to the Q&A function. I welcome any and all questions from our viewers. Um, the score. So uh, here's an interesting question. Uh, would you consider collaborating with companies like the Score Media or would you consider yourselves competitors? Um, are you able to take advantage in a greater way uh, to Ontario opening since they are largely sports betting? And would, would that require Bill C218 to be passed? Yeah, so that's, a, I think, a great example of what our B2B model is for. Um, and the fact that 
we can take somebody who's a media company. I know, I know the score has moved into U.S. betting, um, but I believe that was with Betworks, um, who just got acquired. Um, so, so to be seen what what they do in the you know their next step, and especially around the Canadian step. You know, they may be a group that does want to own technology in the future, um, but it's a great example. We look to people who have large audiences in the markets we want to do, and maybe not gambling audiences to start, but maybe with a high propensity, the type of people who will gamble and sports fans are the types of people who want to gamble. Um, so we can take a brand like that and take away all their burden of getting through licensing, getting technical audits done, keeping key positions, having directors in the markets we need them in, having, you know, servers on the ground, all of those things. So, so th that's like an ideal type partner for us in our B2B platform. Um, so looking for that in terms of the C218, um, it doesn't have to be repealed for things to move ahead. I think people see it as a catalyst for it though, because um, if, if Canada moves ahead and doesn't pass that and then our provinces open up, they, they're still at a severe disadvantage to the offshore operators when you, especially for any serious better, understands betting and the type of better you want ultimately on your sites. Um, they're not going to use Canadian sites if, if they can't single match bet. Perfect. Okay, so Scott, I know you got to jump in a few minutes here um, and we only had 45 minutes allocated. So one more question just around the cash situation at FANS. Obviously, you guys did the $5 million raise in connection with the ASCOT merger. Uh, does FANS not have any plans to raise money in the near future um, or are you cashed up? Yeah, I can answer that. So um, we did do that raise um, in, in end of July, which we closed. So we do have about three and a half million dollars cash on hand right now. So um, that gives us the opportunity to be flexible. You know, right now we're just really focused again, on, as Scott keeps mentioning, on execution. So that's really our focus. Um, we have no immediate plans to go out there and, and fundraise right now because um, we do have you know, over a year of runway left and that's without revenues ramping up, which we expected, so. Okay, so um, yeah, if you have any last minute questions to our attendees, uh, please submit them to the Q&A function. I'll wait one, one second here. Okay, so just uh, before we uh, leave here, so Scott, Darius, um, the next six to 12 months are gonna be pretty um, important for the company, obviously with the gambling sector um, getting bigger and bigger. Um, really every week, it seems these days, um, what do you want to leave uh, investors with? Like, what can they look forward to over the next six months? What catalysts, uh, what, and what really milestones, um, are you guys looking to achieve if you were to sum it up? Yeah, a couple of key ones is, um, uh, will be, you know, additional licensing, uh, is going to be a big one. So showing that we're, uh, we're, we're sort of a globally licensed company and get through any jurisdiction. That's gonna be a key one for us. Opens up the European market more for us in terms of business development. So that's an area uh, where we're poised for. Um, US, so seeing what we can do in the US will be will be a big catalyst for us. Um, and, uh, and then revenue. So we're in a nice spot now where every piece of our business um, is generating revenue. Uh, some is just at the very beginning, so they're going to actually be able to, to follow that revenue ramp. And, and I think, um, you know, anybody who's looking at companies, I think, should look to the, the teams behind it. And, I, you know, we have a very solid team uh, history. We've got a long history combined. You know, Darius and I both started our companies over seven years ago. Um, we've got the ability to execute on financings and things like that. So, so the big ones around us are the, the I think, the nice ones investors want to see is, is revenue. Um, execution on the the models of, of adding customers and, and uh, signing deals. So um, those those are really where we're focused, and I think that's what people can can watch for with us. Darius, anything on that add there? No, that's great. I think as as, uh, as Scott mentioned, it's just focused on growth right now in all three aspects of our business. I think we have the the team to do it. Perfect. So yeah, we'll leave it there. So that's all the time we have today. So. Scott and Darius, thanks for being with us. And for our attendees, thanks for viewing. Um, for anyone that didn't get their questions answered, if you have any other questions, you can reach us at info at thesiscapital.ca. Uh, we will be publishing this interview. Um, if you want an interview, if you want to pass it to anyone else, um, please reach out again to info at thesiscapital.ca. Again, Scott, Darius, uh, thank you for your time and thank you for providing us an update. Thanks for having us. Thank you, everyone. Cheers.